Bibles this morning, open to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, a passage in Hebrews 11, verse number 4. As we talk today, we're going to continue dealing with Hebrews 11, and today I want to talk about, the title of the sermon is, A Dead Man Still Speaking. Hebrews 11, verse number 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaks. The Bible says of Abel, he being dead yet speaks. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the old saying that dead men tell no tales. Unfortunately, that's not true. They do tell tales according to this passage here. Abel was, has been dead for thousands of years, and yet the Scripture says that he still is speaking. He's preaching a sermon that is vital. And, uh, and so the question is, what is he saying to us? I want us to look at that today. Now, if you were with us last week, you know that Hebrews 11 is called the faith chapter of the Bible. It's been called a God's Hall of Fame because you have listed here in Hebrews 11 great uh, saints from the Old Testament era, all who exercised faith. And last week we looked at a definition of faith. Faith was uh, something that makes the future unknown a present reality. We said that faith takes something hoped for and not realized and gives it substance. Faith sees it. Faith is, gives us the ability to see uh, the invisible. Um, it gives weight or substance to us. We have, uh, th- we have faith in things that are hoped for, things we haven't possessed, uh, things we haven't seen, things yet to come, and yet we believe it so Uh, so strongly that it it gives us substance. It gives us a kind of a present reality. And all faith, if it's true faith, is based upon the revelation of God, the word of God. I hear people say, well, I have faith. And my question is, faith in what? Because you can have faith in the wrong thing. People have faith in self, or they have faith in science, or they have faith in a person or an idea or a philosophy. Uh, Some people have faith in faith. They just believe in the power of faith that if you believe in something, it's going to happen. And that is just simply nonsense. If you have faith in the wrong thing, it's foolish. Real faith is rooted on and in the word of God. What does the Bible say? Uh, Now, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the what? The word of God. So it must be based upon the word of God. Now, this chapter will show that in Old Testament times, there were men many men and women who had nothing but the promises of God. They had the promises of God's word. In fact, look again in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 39. We looked at this last week, but I want you to see it again. And these all having obtained a good report, that is God had a good report about them, through faith received not the promise. That is to say they believed in a promise that had not yet been realized. They had no visible evidence that the promise would be fulfilled, Yet the promises were real to them, so much so that, they, that those promises were substantial. It gave weight to them. These, the promises were so real that it made the future unknown a present reality. And J. Oswald Sanders said this, Faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. And so these people lived in promises that they never, ever Saw. And that is the characteristic of these people that we're going to look at in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, all of them uh, were people who believed God's word. They believed the promises of God. They trusted in those promises, those future promises that were as of yet unrealized in their time. And they had so much weight and substance to them that they were willing to bank their life on it. Now, the people that the writer was writing to, the audience that he was writing to, needed this message of faith because these were people that were considering the claims of Christ. Some of them had made a real commitment to Christ, but others in that congregation had only kind of a shallow uh, commitment to Christ. They were kind of connected to the congregation, connected to the church, but they hadn't really made a full commitment to Christ. Just like we have here this morning in this congregation, there are many people who have made a true commitment to Christ But in a crowd this large, there may be people who are really just connected to the congregation, but they haven't yet made a full commitment to Christ. And this is who the writer is talking to when he writes this. And what he's saying is don't turn back. 
Many of them were considering turning back. If you go back to chapter 10, verse number 38, he says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So the writer is saying, look, don't turn back. Make a full commitment to Jesus and do it in faith. You see, the promise was is that many of these Hebrews had been taught a system of works. They had been taught that they pleased God through works. That's because the Judaism of the first century was not real Old Testament Judaism. It was kind of an apostate form of Judaism, and it taught works. It taught the value of works, and that was the way that they thought. And so the writer of Hebrews is trying to change their thinking. He's trying to deprogram them, as it were, and teach them that faith, the only way that you can please God, the only way that you can get saved, the only way that you can come to God is through faith. And this is not uh, something that is new. This was true all the way back in the Old Testament. That's why he gives an Old Testament verse. He's quoting from the Old Testament in Hebrews 10, 38, when he says, the just shall live by faith. He's quoting there out of Habakkuk. Abraham, when he came to God, the Bible says he believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to change their thinking. And what he's doing is he's going back into the Old Testament and he's showing that all of these Old Testament heroes, all of them were saved by faith. They all lived by faith. They all came to God by faith. They all pleased God by faith. In fact, they had a good report to God because they lived by faith. And he's saying to these people here, that's what you must do. You too must live by faith. And the very first Old Testament saint or hero we could say that the writer points to, we found in verse number four, his name is Abel. Look again in verse four, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You might say that Abel is the first man who ever came to God by faith and exercise faith in this way. You say, well, what about Adam and Eve? Well, Adam and Eve really aren't examples of faith because they had the privilege of, before the fall, of seeing God. They, they really would say walk by sight before the fall. And the Bible says in Hebrews 2, 5, we walk by faith and not by sight. And so they walked and talked with God in the cool of the day. They got to see the manifestation of God's presence through the Shekinah glory. So really... They are not really an example of faith. Abel, on the other hand, was conceived and born outside of Eden. He never saw a manifestation of the invisible God. So Abel then becomes the first example of someone who walks by faith. And really, the writer of Hebrews commends his faith in three important ways. Look at verse 4. First, he offered a better sacrifice. It says a more excellent sacrifice in verse 4. Second, he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. And then thirdly, through faith, though he is dead, the writer says he still speaks. So Abel then is a model of faith in the sacrifice that he brought. And because he believed and because he offered a better sacrifice, the Bible says God declared him to be righteous. He was made righteous. And he, his faith still is a sermon to all of us, even to this day. So I want to look at each of these three things. And if you're taking notes, just write down, number one, we can see, first of all, the sacrifice he offered. Look again at verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, that is, he rested in what God said. You remember, if it's real faith, it has to be rested in what? It has to be rooted in the word of God. It has to be founded in the word of God. And it says more excellent. Notice the more excellent there. That just means a fitting and appropriate sacrifice. Now, really, to understand this, we have to go back to Genesis. So I want you to hold your place in Hebrews 11. Go back to Genesis chapter 4, will you? Go back to Genesis chapter 4, and let's look at this sacrifice that Abel offered. If you go to Genesis 4, what you'll find is in the narrative, there's a purposeful contrast between these two brothers, Cain and Abel. Really, you have to understand this story in contrast with these two brothers. Look at verse number 1 of chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. And she said this. She said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. This is very interesting. Really, there's a play on Hebrew here. Cain is uh, gotten. Uh, Cain is really the name Cain here. And so she's kind of having a play on words here. The word Cain means to receive or uh, I have, or we could really say it like this. I've gotten him. 
I have him. Um, some scholars translate like this. I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Actually, Walt Kaiser argues that it should be translated like this. I have gotten a man, listen to this, even the Lord. What does it mean by that? What does he mean by that? Meaning that Eve thought that she, when she gave birth to Cain, that he was actually the promise that God made in Genesis 3.15. You remember that promise? It's called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. Right after Adam fell, the Bible says God promised that God, through the seed of the woman, would crush the head of the serpent. Remember that? That there was going to come one who would do that. And many Bible scholars believe that Eve thought that Cain was the answer to that promise. And so thus they say it should be translated, I have gotten a man, even the Lord. This is the Messiah that was promised. And of course, she was wrong. We know that. He was definitely not that. In fact, we could argue that he was the Antichrist, you could say, or at least a, a, uh, a paradigm or a pattern of the Antichrist. And then there was Abel in verse um, 2, and she bare again his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel actually means vanity or breath. By this time, Eve was perhaps thoroughly impressed with the impact of God's curse on creation. Perhaps by this time, she was feeling the vanity of life outside the garden. It was beginning to take its toll. And it's interesting that she probably had a lot of hope in her first son, Cain, thinking he would be the deliverer. But by the time Abel came around, she was expressing less than hope. She was feeling the vanity of their existence. The Bible says Abel was a shepherd, Cain was a farmer. So we see the first shepherd, the first farmer. And again, life outside the garden was difficult. They had to work for their food. Ains, uh, excuse me, Abel occupied, or, uh, the, or his occupation, I should say, was to provide clothing. Cain provided food. But now look at the rest of it. Look at verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, verse 4, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offering, but unto Cain unto his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. What we see here really is a contrast in the way they try to approach God. We could say the contrast in their worship. Cain, what did he bring in verse number 3? The Bible says he brought the fruit of the ground. Abel brought uh, a lamb or, uh, of the flock. Now, I want you to notice that there was a definite place of worship that God had prescribed because it says in verse 3 that they brought to the Lord, brought it unto the Lord. Verse 3, Cain brought of the fruit. And verse 4, and Abel also, he brought of the firstling. You know what that implies? If you bring it to the Lord, there has to be a certain place, right? God had to designate that here is the place, here is where you bring your offering to me. And so that suggested to me that there was a place designated for worship where they brought their sacrifice, a place where they would go to the presence of God. In fact, look at verse 16, chapter 4, verse 16, where it says of Cain, and Cain went out from the what? Presence of the Lord. Again, that suggests there had to be a place that God had set up where there was his presence. There was a place where you would worship God. So God had to reveal that to them, a place of worship. God dwelt at a certain place. He established an altar there at that place. And it was based on that altar that they had to come to God's presence. They had to bring a sacrifice to that altar in order to enter into God's presence. So what's God doing here? He's prescribing through his word, his revelation, how to worship him. It was a definite place but also a definite time. Look at verse 3 where it says, and in the process of time. That actually there, process is kates at the end of time is the Hebrew word yom, which is the word day. Or we could say it like, and that's a plural form there, by the way, so we could translate it like this, and at the end of days, at the end of days. And I think this means at the end of the week. God had established a certain place to go and worship and come into the presence of God. 
he established a certain time at the end of the days. I think this was at the end of the days of the week, I believe, is what he's talking about there. So what are we learning here? God established how to worship him, a certain place, a certain time, but then also a certain manner on how you could approach God. God could be approached in worship only by means of what? By sacrifice. There had to be a sacrifice, a place, a time, and a manner. Now, neither Cain nor Abel would have known anything about this unless they had been what? Unless they'd been taught, unless God revealed it to them. This is how you do this. And I believe God taught them what he expected. It was to be a blood sacrifice. It was to be offered on the altar there. That's the, that's the basis upon which you can come into God's presence. Now, I know I've read some commentaries where it says that Cain's offering of vegetables was, there, was fine. It was his attitude that was wrong. And let me just say that our attitude in worship is certainly important. But I do believe that what God was looking for here was the right sacrifice, which would be a blood sacrifice. The Bible said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And besides, Cain really didn't cop an attitude until after God rejected his offering. And so really, attitude has nothing to do with it. What there's a contrast here is a contrast between the two offerings and the way in which a person approached God. Cain's offering was bloodless. It was the fruit of his own labor. It was the works of his own hands. It was the fruit of the ground. By the way, what did God just do to the ground after the fall? He cursed the ground. You're going to bring to God something out of the ground that God cursed and expect that to be acceptable to God? But in contrast to this, Abel's offering was the best of his flock. It was a blood sacrifice. There had to be life taken. And the imagery is of someone innocent who had to die for sin. Life had to be taken. Blood had to be shed. There's a lot of imagery there. It was without Abel's works or labor. And that's why the Bible says in Hebrews 11:4 that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, faith in what? Faith in what God said. God said, this is the way you are to approach me. Here's a certain place. Here is the time. Here is the manner. I want a sacrifice. I want it to be a blood sacrifice. This was the revelation of God to them. And you know what faith does? Faith simply believes the revelation of God. Faith obeys. It didn't say Abel was more excellent but his sacrifice was more excellent. It wasn't personal. It's not that God liked Abel and he didn't like Cain. It wasn't that at all. It was that Abel heard God's word. He believed God. He approached God in the divinely appointed way and Cain did not. He didn't believe he needed any blood sacrifice. He believed that he could come up with his own way to approach God, a self-styled sacrifice, a self-styled system of worship. And I submit to you, beloved, that there are still people that think that way today. They can approach God on their own way. They can come up with their own plan of worship. They don't recognize the need, the need for atonement. And you know who Cain is? Cain is the father of false religion. He's the father of false worship. In fact, Jude would later write in Jude 11, Woe well unto them, they have gone in the way of Cain. He was talking about apostate false religion and religious leaders. They have gone the way of Cain. There are many people today that want to come to God on their own terms. They want to establish their works, righteousness in their own way. And Cain is the first purveyor of false religion. Jesus said this very clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. He's the only way. So we see the sacrifice that he offered. He offered a better sacrifice. But also write down, here's number two. We see the salvation he obtained. The salvation he obtained because, again, in Hebrews 11:4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous God testifying of his gifts now think about that the writer is saying that how do we know that God accepted Abel's sacrifice that he did not accept Cain's the Bible says that God testified 
of, of the offering that he accepted. There was some evident token that God did that showed that he accepted Cain's sacrifice and Abel's he did not. Look again in verse 4 of chapter 4 of, of, of uh, Genesis. And Abel also brought of the first thing of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, verse 5, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. There was some visible demonstration from God that showed Abel that his sacrifice was accepted and showed that Cain's was not. So we could say that there was a definite acceptance of their worship. And, and, and how did God manifest that? How did they know? I, I think that here's what I believe. I believe that the way God demonstrated that he accepted Abel's sacrifice was that fire came down from heaven or maybe fire came from God and just consumed the sacrifice. You say, why would you say that? Well, let me tell you why. I think because of the pattern of the Old Testament. For example, in Leviticus 9.24, it says, There came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering. There, that was a visible sign that God accepted that offering. What was it? Fire that devoured the offering. When Gideon prepared an offering, the Bible says fire uh, uh, consumed it. Remember the contest on Mount Carmel with Elijah and the prophets of Baal? The prophets of Baal had their altar. Elijah had his. Elijah said, let the God who's God, let, it, let him consume it with fire. And the Bible says fire came down from heaven and consumed uh, Elijah's sacrifice there. When David offered a sacrifice in 1 Chronicles 21, 26, it says David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he, that is God, answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of the burnt offering. When David made an altar, burnt sacrifice, God came down with fire. And we also see this when Solomon did the same thing. So I don't think I'm going out on too much of a limb here by saying that God manifested to them very clearly whose sacrifice that he accepted. I think that when Abel came, he brought the best of his flock, cut the throat of the animal, the blood was shed. And I think that fire came down and consumed that sacrifice because God accepted it. It pointed to the innocent one who would come and die for sin. I think the fire speaks of the wrath of God that Jesus bore on the cross for us when he bore our sin, death. And then Cain comes with his offering. And I think his offering was perhaps very beautiful. I can imagine beautiful uh, fruit and vegetables there. No doubt the choices of his uh, product there. And uh, he offered it. No, no doubt there was considerable toil and labor that went into producing a good crop. Because remember, they had to work hard now because of the curse on the ground. And Cain took a lot of pride in what he had accomplished. A lot of sweat. A lot of work. And he brought that and put it on the altar before the Lord. Nothing happened. No sacrifice. No fire. Sacrifice was not accepted. God did not respect Cain's offering. Despite what God had asked, Cain thought he had a better way. And the Bible says that God did not respect Cain's offering in verse 5. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. He got very, very angry because God uh, did not accept it. You see, the lamb pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think, again, Cain and Abel both knew what God wanted. But Cain wanted to be accepted by God based on his own good works. And there you have at the very beginning, beloved, the beginning of two religions. And I, you've heard me say this before. There's only two religions in the world. There's man's way and there's God's way. Man's religion is do religion. I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll do this. God's religion is done religion. It's what's already been done for you by the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And based on that, then, God declared Abel righteous. This is the same way that anybody gets saved. This is what later what happened to Abraham when the Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Here, Abel, by faith, obeys the word of God 
And in response to that, God uh, makes him righteous. He declares him righteous. And again, beloved, this is how everybody gets saved. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is showing these Hebrew Christians. All the way back in the beginning, Abel exercised faith in the promise of God. And he was declared righteous. He lived by, he was saved by faith. He lived by faith. People in the Old Testament got saved the same way that people in the New Testament or we get saved today. They looked forward to the promise of the Messiah on the cross. What do we do? We look back on the promised Messiah. In fact, that's what we do at the Lord's Supper. Didn't you just do that? What do we do here in this ordinance? We looked back to the cross. We look back by faith. I've never seen Jesus. Now, I know there's some people that say that they have. I just doubt it. I'm talking about people that live today. I'm not talking about the apostles, all right? There's some people today that say, oh, I saw, listen, I've never seen Jesus. If you say you've seen him, I'm not going to argue with you about it. And please don't come and tell me your story about how you saw Jesus. <laughs> I've never seen him, but I do know this. I know he's alive. And I know that he died for my sins, and I know that he rose again, and I know that he intercedes in heaven for me, and I know he's coming back again. Faith helps us to reach out and see that. We can see the invisible by faith. We see it. We look back on it. We see him hanging there on the cross for us. So all of us are saved in the same way. But here's the bottom line. Faith re results in obedience, and God declared Abel righteous there at that time. Let me give you the third thing quickly. We saw, we saw that the sacrifice he offered and the salvation he obtained. Now I want you to see the sermon he outlined. And I want you to see again in Hebrews 11.4, at the end of that verse, it says, And by it, he being dead yet speaks. God is saying that Abel still is speaking today, still preaching. He died thousands of years ago, but he still speaks today. And how does he speak? Well, I think, first of all, he speaks to God. If you look in this story, look in chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy account that it's fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt not be, shall thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And what was God saying there to Cain? You know, why are you wroth? You've been told the way to do it. But he was so filled with pride. And God gives him a warning. He says, you better be careful. Sin lies at the door. Now, I know some interpret this as if to say, a sin offering is lying there at the door for you. Just use that sin offering. And that's not what it means there. It means this. If you continue in this way, sin is crouching, and it'll jump on you like an animal. It'll get worse. You haven't seen nothing yet. This is a warning from God to Cain. And Cain didn't accept that warning. Look at, look at verse number 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up and against Abel, his brother, and slew him. The word for slew here really is the idea of cutting the throat, murder out of the hand. You know, this is the first murder. How do you even know how to kill somebody at this time? You probably do it by watching a sacrifice being offered. And how did Abel offer the sacrifice of that animal, cut his throat? And the blood came out. I think this is exactly what Cain did to Abel. And the sense here is, okay, God, you want a blood sacrifice, I'll give you one. And he killed his brother out of anger. And, and John would later compare this guy, Cain, as the Antichrist, a pattern of the Antichrist. And John tells us we shouldn't be surprised when the unbelievers are, are attacking and martyring believers. That happened all the way in the beginning. And he, he warns us about that. But we see Cain's wickedness. But here's the point. Look in verse number 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? He lies to God. And verse 10, And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries to me from the ground. There's the first sermon right there. The blood of Abel in a metaphoric way is crying out to God. And really the first point of the sermon here is that um, God will avenge Innocent blood. Friend, you can just mark that down. God is the avenger of innocent blood. He also speaks, really, not only to God does Abel speak, but also to his brother. Look at verse 11. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which has opened 
her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Verse 12, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength of fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And here is God's punishment. And this is the message, really, that you can't sin and get away with it. God will punish sin severely. And how did God punish Abel, uh, Cain's sin? Well, first of all, he said, you're not going to be able to till the ground anymore. And anything that you touch is not going to yield uh, a fruit or, or vegetables. The ground is not going to be good to you. You can till the ground. It will not yield unto thee her strength, it says there. And so you'll be a failed farmer. When you till the ground, it will yield nothing. This is part of the curse that God put upon Cain. Whatever you touch will die. Sometimes I think I have that curse on me, you know, when it comes to plants. You know, people give me a plant and say, this plant can't die, you know. <laughs> sure enough, you give it to me, you know what happens? It dies. God said to Cain, whatever you touch. And by the way, this was at the point of his pride. Because what did he take pride in? Being able to produce fruits and vegetables that were beautiful. God said, not anymore. You won't be able to uh, farm the ground will yield nothing, and you'll be a fugitive the rest of your life. You'll wander all around, and you'll be driven from men. This would be the curse that God put upon Cain. And basically what uh, Abel was saying, the, the sermon that he was preaching is, you can't sin and get by with it. God will punish you. But here's the third thing, and really this is the point. And really, Abel speaks to God. His blood does. Abel speaks to uh, his brother. But Abel also speaks to us, this later generation, because, again, I think the primary meaning in Hebrews 4 is really that in this later generation, Abel is preaching a sermon to all of us. And what is the sermon? The sermon is man comes to God by faith, not by works. That's the whole point. Obey revelation above one's own reason and will. And sin will be severely punished. And so what does Abel say to us? The, the timeless three-point outline that Abel gives to us is that very thing. Man comes to God by faith. Obey God's word above your own reason. That's what faith is. And that sin will severely be punished. Really, the title of Abel's, of Abel's sermon could be, The just shall live by faith. You approach God by faith, by obeying what he says. Luther said this, Luther observed that when Abel was alive, he could not teach even his only brother by his faith and example. But now that he is dead, he teaches the whole world. And he concluded he is more alive than ever. So the great lesson here is a lesson of faith. And I want to ask you, beloved, as we close today, have you placed your faith in the word of God, in the, in what the God and what the word of God has to say about the sacrifice of Christ. Have you obeyed that? Can you say with absolute assurance, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness by faith. Let's, let's bow together for prayer today. Lord, help us to learn from Abel's wonderful example and the sermon that he still preaches to us today. Lord, this is a word that we need in this day and age of self-styled religion, of self-styled worship. When man in his own pride wants to approach you on his own merits, on his own religious works, this whole idea is so pervasive even in the world today. And against that backdrop of man's pride, we hear this sermon from Abel, who says, by faith, we approach God only through sacrifice, the blood that was shed. And of course, that speaks to us of the precious blood of Christ that was shed. Lord, that's the only way that we can approach you. It's the only way we would dare approach your holy presence. And Lord, not only do we approach your presence initially by faith, but each and every day of our life, we live by faith in what you say. Father, all of my hope is in what your word says, all of it, all of it. And every day, Lord, may we renew our commitment to live by faith. 
And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, I, again, I just want to ask, friend, is that your testimony, the same testimony as Abel had, that I approach God by faith and based on what he has revealed, and I put my faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Can you say that with absolute assurance that you're saved today because your faith is in the shed blood of Jesus Christ? Friend, if you can't say that, may I encourage you right there where you are, make where you sit an altar and come to God today by faith and confess to him. Say it in your own words. Cry out to God. Say, Lord, I'm here and I need you and I repent and I come to you by faith in the finished work of Christ. Say it and mean it, friend, and he'll save you. And if you're a Christian, we need to be reminded and renewed every day that we live by faith in the promises of God. We don't live by sight. We don't live by senses so much. We don't live by reason. We live by faith. That faith gives us substance. The promises of God become real. It pulls the future into the present. Father, may this be our testimony. Teach us to be people who live totally, completely by faith. We pray in Jesus' precious name.